Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give a hand for our praise team. Amen, y'all. Amen. I don't know if y'all know or not. I used to be on the praise team if you weren't here a long, long, long time ago. And they dismissed me. <laughs> I love this church. I love Pastor Mark's heart for music. He not only talks about, you know, sings a song, but he ensures that they are biblically accurate before they come before the people. And as of today, Pastor Mark and his family, Katie, where's Katie at? Katie, oh, she's over there, okay. They have done 21 years and 15 days at Sherwood Baptist Church, to be exact. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Pastor Jim is going to come and talk more about that after the service and, and just really congratulate them both. But as a, as a man who loves math, I did some quick math and just kind of looking at this. If Mark was to sing during that time of 21 years and 15 days, if he sang 48 weeks during the year, that would be 1,008 Sundays. If he averaged eight songs a Sunday, that's morning and evening, he would have sang or orchestrated 8,064 praise songs. If you do the church math times two, carry the one, divided by three, 50,000. Mark has directed 50,000 songs. <laughs> but man, we praise God for him, praise God for his family. And uh, one of the verses, as I was studying and just kind of thinking, Lord, what what do we talk about tonight and, and talk about uh, how do we honor Mark and honor the Lord and, and just looking at the Bible and what the Bible says about it. Let's turn to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. This particular song, if you do any research on this song, this song was written as a liturgical song. And they don't... It started me thinking back of how thankful I am. I'm thankful for a loving and wonderful wife who put up with all of my stuff. All right, she sees the best and the worst of me, so I thank God for her. I thank God for a wonderful son, a son who prays for me and lifts me up and hugs on me. I love the hugs. I mean, I just love it. I love how Jim McBride took me under his wing and, and showed me the importance of learning and studying the Word. I love how Pastor Garrett encourages me every Sunday, and we encourage one another. As a matter of fact, before I was getting ready for this morning's sermon, I was on the third floor in the restroom, and Garrett came in. I said, I'm hiding. You need to go out and preach the sermon. <laughs> but I'm thankful for people that you can stand on the wall with. And as I'm thinking about that, I just th I'm thankful for all the many, many wonderful blessings that the Lord has and has provided. And as a church, we should not stray away from those blessings, but we should look back and we should give thanks to a pastor of 31 years, to faithful people like Mary Johnson and Lauren Johnson who are back here from Oklahoma who came to visit. Amen. We're thankful for people like that who stood in the name of the Lord, gave a great example of faithfulness. I'm just thankful for Jesus. Amen. Without him, my life would be lost. I am not joking. I would be dead in jail or on drugs. No if, ands, or buts about it. If it wasn't for the blood of Jesus... And some courageous man sharing with me the good news of the gospel, I would be lost. And so throughout our lives, our lives should be rooted in thankfulness. 
If you had a file drawer, you could probably go through it and just say, Lord, I remember when you did this. Oh, I remember when you did this. Oh, I remember when you did this. This was so wonderful. This was preceded by a bad time in my life. But Lord, look how you brought me through. And you're looking at this file of all God's faithfulness to your life. Just think about it right now. How good God has been to each and every one of us. So on Sunday mornings, Sunday morning worship is not a pre-show event. It is not a time where you say, hey, you know, I'll catch it if I can, but if not, I'm just going to come in and slide in the back. This is not a halftime show where we come and sit and be entertained. Worship is a time where we come and we are reminded through song of how good God really is. And then we have the opportunity, along with other believers, to participate and say, God, together, you are good. So, so, so worship is not just a bunch of songs that we throw together. It's a time where we come together as a group of believers, and we're saying, God, thank you for all that you've done in and for us. And out of that heart of gratitude, sometimes your hands go up, sometimes they don't. Sometimes your knees may hit the floor, sometimes they may not. Sometimes the tears, you can't hold them back, they just start streaming down your face because you know how good God has been to you. And you just can't tell anybody, and no one will ever know but you and God. But when you come and you stand, and that's what Pastor Mark and Seth do when they come up here and they stand, what they're doing is they're helping us to remember all the great things that God has done. And as you're singing, you're thinking about the words. You're saying, yep, God, I remember that. I remember that. I remember how you saved me, how you raised me, how you healed me. You remember all those things that God has done in your life. And so Psalms 107 is that song. The psalmist is reminding the children of Israel how good God has been. So if you go to that particular scripture, Psalms 107, we'll start looking at what the psalmist says. Tonight, this will be more of a teaching session. It won't be a shotgun approach like this morning. <laughs> so just get your Bible out. Make sure you have notes out and you're writing and writing these things down so that you can remember and give thanks to God for all that he's done in your life. And when I look at the scripture, it says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. And verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Now, let me break those three verses down for you. When the psalmist says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, that word give thanks is to publicly raise your hands and lift them in adoration and reverence unto God. Did y'all know that? That is when he says, oh, give thanks, on multiple occasions in Psalms, you see David saying, oh, give thanks unto the Lord. He's saying, hey, publicly lift your hands and lift them in reverence unto God. And he's going to tell you why he says after that, because he is so good. <laughs> he is good. He's good, y'all. When I talk about the word good, I'm talking about favorable, pleasing, pleasant, and right. And he's the best. He is the best. And so when David says, lift your hands, basically what he's saying is lift your, our hands together in worship and thanks to our God because he has guided us all this way and his ways have been favorable toward us and it has been good and the best thing for us. Oh, give thanks. So this evening, as we talk about this particular, we're talking about giving thanks to a wonderful and loving God because he's been so kind to us. Now, the verse that really gets me, Bartel, is verse 2. Because then he says not only what to do, but who should be doing it. He says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. 
He says, if you have not had an experience with this, I'm not going to tell you to raise your hands. But if you have been redeemed by the enemy, I want you to give thanks unto the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Listen, listen to this. When it talks about let the redeemed of the Lord say so, it gives the implication of helplessness. You were captured and held as a slave under a cruel master. The forces that held you captive were so great, you could not overcome them on your own. It was only by the intervention of a third and more powerful party that you were able to be freed from slavery. Man, the superhero Jesus came in and saved the day, rescued your life from a more powerful party than you were. And that is why we should be giving thanks. So in the next couple of verses, over the next 30 verses, the psalm starts outlining who are the redeemed. Who are these people we call the redeemed? So let's take a look at that. Because inside of these four types of people that the psalmist talks about, there are five stages of those who have been redeemed. Okay, and this is not on your notes, so you can write this down. There are five stages. It lists who the people are that have been redeemed. Who the people are that have been redeemed. It lists their current situation. Who the people are, and it lists their current situation. It also lists their point of helplessness when they couldn't run any longer. It gives God's actions and then the appropriate response. So over the four people that we're going to see here in Scripture, the redeemed, these five things will be prevalent in all of those parts of Scripture. So let's take a look at those. Number one, point number one. He saved the wanderer. He saved the wanderer. When I say the wanderer, we can relate it to everyday life. This is the person who is looking for truth or looking for the solution to life's problems. Young people, you will be looking for truth to life's problems. As you walk through this, you'll have multiple people telling you what the truth is, and there will be plastered up on billboards and saying, this is the truth, and this type of lifestyle is the truth. And God is saying, hey, listen, don't listen to that. Listen to the Word of God. And so he talks about this wanderer. Look at the verse. Look at verse 4. He says, they wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty, and their soul fainted within them. Look at verse 6. He says, and then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. Listen to what, this is how he did it. He led them also by a straight way to, to go to an inhabited city. And then he tells them what to do. He says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness. You see that? And for his wonders to the sons of men, for he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul. He is filled with what is good. He saved the wanderer. Most of you have been in that position that he talks about in Scripture. You were the wanderer. You were the person that was walking and searching for truth, looking for a place where you can be fed and where your thirst could be filled. And so at, that, at the very right time, Jesus Christ came and rescued you and pulled you out. And so the Bible says, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. He rescued you. You are the redeemed. Amen? Amen? Let's look at the second one. As we look at the scripture, first he saved the wanderer, then he saved the wretched. He saved the wanderer, then he saved the wretched. 
Look at this. The wretched I describe as those under the strain of depression and addictions. These are people that have been captured by sin, and sin just has a complete grip on their lives. But God says, you know what? I captured them too. I redeemed them as well. Look at what the Bible says. There were those, in verse 10, there were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains. You see that? I love this. Because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, listen to what he did to them. He humbled their heart with labor. They stumbled, and there was nobody to help them. Mercy, mercy, mercy. You got somebody out there who are, who's wretched, running from the Lord that you know? Start praying this prayer for them. Verse 13. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. Anyone can be saved. There is room at the cross for all. He has promised to redeem us. And so they need to come out, give their lives to Jesus. It doesn't matter if they've been lost, if they've been wretched. Jesus is waiting for them. And then verse 14, it says, He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, broke apart the bands, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness, for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has shattered the gates of bronze and cut the bars asunder, the iron asunder. And these are people who have been trapped in the prison of life. And Jesus came in and rescued them. They are the redeemed. Amen? Let's look at number three. Number three, verses 17 through 23, he saved the wayward. He saved the wayward. That wayward person is a person who persists in making choices that lead to destruction. You ever known anybody? It doesn't matter what they do, they're doing something wrong. <laughs> It's like you got to keep your eye on them because every time you turn around, they're doing something that is far outside the boundaries. But guess what? Jesus came for them as well, Amen. the wayward. Look at what the Scripture says about them. Fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all kinds of foods, and they drew near to the gates of death. But in verse 19, then they cried out to the Lord in all their trouble, and he saved them out of all their distress. Verse 20 is a very famous verse. Sometimes we take this verse out of context, or we take it from inside of this context, and we use it uh, sometimes appropriately, sometimes inappropriately. But listen to what it says. He sent his word, and he healed them. That means they heard the word of God and they were healed and delivered them from their destructions. We need to trust God and trust his word that it can do exactly what he sends it to do. It can break the bonds of some very strong addictions and set people free and they won't even look the same. They won't even sound the same. Because of the saving power of Jesus Christ, he came for the wayward. He did. Now, verse 22, he says this. Let them also offer sacrifice of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. Going back to singing there, Mark. You see that? And then the next one. The fourth one. You th you, sometimes you start to think that it's just people who are down and out, drug addicts. You think about people who are just down on their luck, and you're thinking, hey, these are the people that God just came to save, all right? Or these people in this certain demographic, these are the only people that need salvation. But in verse 23 through 32, he came and he saved the wealthy. He saved the wealthy. Look at the Scripture 
those who go down into the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and the wonders of his deep. These are people that have gone out and they're doing business and things are going well for them. And in verse 25, he says, he spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the, way, the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens, and they went down into the depths, and their souls melted away in their misery, and they reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. And then they did what? They cried unto the Lord, and he brought them out of their distress. He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea, the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet. So he guided them into their desired haven. Verse 31 says, And let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them exalt, extol him also in the congregation of the people. Listen, he said, let them in the congregation of the people give thanks to the Lord because he's been so good and praise him at the seat of the elders. In verse 33, it talks about, it continues to talk about why we should praise and give thanks to the Lord. He changes the rivers into a wilderness and the springs of water into a thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in. He changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. Anybody else out here ex experienced that before? A place that has been dry in your life or a situation that has been dry, no way out whatsoever, and God came through? The psalmist is reminding people why you should give thanks to the Lord, because he is good. Verse 36, and there he makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city and sow fields and plant gardens and gather a fruitful harvest. He also blesses them and they multiply greatly and he does not let their cattle decrease when they are diminished and bowed down through oppression, misery, and sorrow, he pours contempt on the princes and he makes them wander in a pathless, a pathless waste. But he sets the needy securely on high away from affliction. He makes his families like a flock. The upright see it and are glad, but the unrighteous shuts his mouth. Verse 43 says this, Who is wise? What does it say in the scripture? Let him give heed to these things and consider the loving kindness of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So as we come into this place, as we come on Sunday mornings, we should be not just listening to the songs and just sitting and just kind of saying, you know what, that sounds good, I like the beat to that song, but you are listening to the words and you're saying, God, you have been so, so good. Now, the good thing about this church is there is so much diversity, okay? Everybody is not going to raise their hands the same. Everyone is not going to clap their hands the same. Some of us. Why are y'all laughing? <laughs> y'all know what I'm about to say. Some of us, you. And you almost got it. it it's almost there. We were like, we're, we're rooting for you back there. We're like, just. Uh. But guess what? It doesn't matter. The Bible says, gives thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. When you are thanking the Lord, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Sometimes, some Sundays, I sit here on this front seat and I just raise my hand because I realize that God has been so, so good to me. And my thankfulness drowns out everything else that's going on around me. 
And this is what the psalmist is telling us to do. When Mark and Seth are leading in worship and we're listening to these songs, our, our gratitude drowns out everything else around us. So guess what? You may see some people dancing because you don't know what God has done in their lives. Now, I better not see nobody up here running around the church. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> But you just don't know what God has done in their lives. When you see somebody walk up to the altar and they're just profusely crying on the altar and they're like, God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's because they know what they've been through. And they are thanking a holy God for bringing them through. This is not just a halftime show. This is not just a pre-service warm-up. This is to help us and lead us into a place. Matter of fact, you are already in the presence of the Lord. You are being led to thank God for all the wonderful things that he's done. Last thing. In the scripture, whenever you look at scripture and you're studying scripture, you, I look for things that are continuously repetitive in the Scripture, continuously repetitive. What, what is God trying to say in this Scripture? You know, first, you know, you look at the first couple of words, and it's let the redeemed, and I'm looking at the word redeemed, and I'm like, man, that is awesome. But then he continually says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonderful works. It says that four times in verse 8, verse 15, verse 21, and verse 31. So I said, Lord, I don't want to assume anything because when you look at Bible verses, they could mean something different than what the English language defines them as. And so I want to make sure that I'm looking at the right thing. And so this word, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness. That word loving kindness means a strong, faithful, true, merciful, and devoted love for his people. He says, let them give thanks because God is devoted to you. He's devoted. You are the apple of his eye. Just like he was for the children of Israel, he was devoted to them and loving them and bringing them out of captivity and bringing them into a dry and peaceful land. And so when we thank God for his loving kindness, I'm saying, God, I thank you because, God, you have been devoted to the backslider. And I saw a video on YouTube. The young people may know this, this video, but you see the sheep jumping along. The guy's pulling the sheep out of the hole, and as soon as the sheep gets free, he jumps and just goes right back in the hole. <laughs> have y'all seen that video? I was like, man, if that ain't Kim Bevel, I don't know who is. <laughs> Jump along, pull you out, jump along, jump right back, jump right back in there. But you know what? God is always faithful. And he comes and he rescues you once again, pulls you out, dusts you off, cleans you up, and there you go again. <laughs> Throughout my life, I'm trying to get less and less in the, in the ditch. But what I do know is those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And that's what I depend on. His loving kindness. And then secondly, and for his wonders to the sons of men. His wonders to the sons of men. And when I look at that word, his wonders to the sons of men, it means to be marvelous extraordinary, be beyond one's own power to do wonderful acts. There is no one that can do what he does. Nobody. His wonderful acts toward man. You look at your life and you start thinking about the things that God has done for you and you say, God, there was no one that could have did that besides you. 
There is no one that could have saved me from that situation. There is no one that could have paid the price that Jesus paid for me on the cross. God, there is no one that could have done that for me. And so, God, we praise you for your wonderful acts towards mankind. We thank you. And as we close tonight, and we're going to close in prayer, look back at 43. I want you to read it. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and look at it. Who is wise, let them give heed to these things and consider the loving kindness of the Lord. Amen? So we're going to take just a few minutes of prayer here. I want you to bow your heads. And I want you to think about the thing that God has most recently brought you through. And I want you to give thanks to him. Now I want you to think about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember the day that you gave your life to Jesus Christ. And I want you to thank him for saving you. Now I want you to think about someone, and you were probably thinking of this as we were talking through this scripture, someone whose life fits the things that we were talking about, the wayward, the wicked, or all those. Would you pray for them and ask God to heal them and bring them out of their, of their mess when they cry out to them, God comes and rescues them. Would you pray for them right now? Father, we thank you for tonight. And God, we don't say that just tongue in cheek, but God, we thank you. We honestly thank you for what you've done. God, there have been things and seasons in our life, God, that if it had not been for you, we would not have made it. But you sent your word and you healed us. God, you rescued us out of our distress. And Father, you said in verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. God, we've been redeemed by your hand. And God, we just want to say thank you. Sometimes the pressures of life, God, will, will, will push us away from spending quality time just giving thanks. But tonight... God, we just want to say thank you for all that you've done. So, Father, I pray that tonight we would continue to honor you, honor Mark Willard, honor this church, honor this community that you put us in, and give thanks for all the great things that you've done. Lord, would you continue to be with us? Speak to our hearts in prayer. Allow us to line up with your word and to forever have a heart of gratitudes and thanks. It is in your son Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Pastor Jim is going to come and speak just a few minutes.